Hey guys, scientists in a lab don't hold hands and pray for results. Muslims going to a mosque don't put on a lab coat and perform scientific experiments. They pray and worship their creator God, collecting imaginary bonus points to achieve lots of virgins and wine in an imaginary afterlife. They listen to stories about evil spirits, demons and devils, and speaking of which, atheists. They don't go to a mosque to learn about nature, but the supernatural. Not, not like atheists who go to universities and then develop TVs and phones and medicine, and then don't even dedicate this to a god, but to the well-being of mankind. Muslims pray for the well-being of themselves. Atheists develop TVs, phones and medicine because they have the education, experience and knowledge to do so. And half the Muslim population is illiterate. An ideology based on religion, in general, loves a simple static world. A world where a supreme being provides the only possible answer to problems and questions. A world where humans are the obedient slaves to their lord and master, embedded in simple rituals. A world where all there is to consider is a lone star and a moon, orbiting a static flat planet. A world without the complication of millions and millions of super big galaxies, each with millions and billions of stars, moons and planets. A world without the complication of quantum fluctuations and fields of the super small components, which are the building blocks of everything we currently know. Now, after a debate in Melbourne about religion in today's world, several talking points remained. One of them was the attempt at making a girl aged nine having sex seem perfectly justifiable, which it is definitely not. This a nine-year-old was physically fit, was mentally ready, was uh, even given away by her own father and her tribe. So the point is we have principles which makes our law far more timeless rather than putting a number and saying you could do it when you're 16. I think any normal human being on the planet today will agree that the mere thought of a nine-year-old girl playing with dolls and then being called to have sex with a 54-year-old man is revolting. There's no need whatsoever to try and justify or even to discuss this. So another contentious topic was a simple statement. Knowledge is haram. The roaring laughter even woke up a guy in the first row who was peacefully sleeping. Knowledge under Islam is haram or is forbidden. <laughs> At the time, I thought the statement was odd and something too strong and, and not based on textual evidence. And actually, I did not decide. This was an off the cuff remark, so I did not assign this too much importance. I mean, but Hamza the liar at Sorts challenged Mr. Yeah, he's always had a problem with academic titles, Dr. Perkins, and accused him of lying and now wanted to teach Dr. Perkins manners. It is very friendly. I'm just trying to teach people manners. Now, because Hamza, as does every Muslim apologist, well, they always present the evidence for the claims, don't they? And he now demands not only evidence, but proof for the validity of Dr. Perkins' statement. You can't lie. So I'm very close to walking out, but I'm not because I want to respect all of you. I want to ask Mr. Perkins a question. You said knowledge is haram in Islam. I want you to give me the proof. So when apologists started complaining about it, I thought about it for a moment and then said to myself, now hang on, there's actually some truth here. When Dr. Perkins explained the reasoning behind it, Hamza flatly declared that a lie. He accused Dr. Perkins of never having read anything by Al-Ghazali and then made a comment which demonstrated his own obnoxious and condescending attitude, the incoherence of philosophers. You see, it's full of reason and rationality. <laughs> I mean, that's hardly the point or the, the central point of the book. But Muslim apologists like Hamza are such simpletons and are too primitive to understand this. The entire book is about the inconsistency between reason and revelation and how revelation is superior in case of inconsistencies. So Dr. Perkins could not provide any sentences from the Quran which substantiated his assertion, even though Hamza demanded it and made a big deal out of it. So knowing Hamza, I knew he was just making this up and was acting for the audience, which received the expected result. 
but it got me interested. I decided not to take a guess on my first gut reaction, my quick recollection of the contents of the Quran, my instinct and, and intuition as ultimate result, but to take a harder look at this and then did a more systematic, fact-based investigation. I looked at the word knowledge and, well, the words which would be considered similar, and the word haram, and where they appear in the Quran and the Hadiths. I went and scanned some commentaries in the form of scholarly tafsirs to see what others made of this. And then I just put everything into the structure, analyzed it, and came to a conclusion. And I think, well, I hope anyway, you will agree that after I've presented the facts and done this in an orderly manner, that the statement, knowledge is haram, is indeed somewhat justified, even if the words don't appear as such in any Islamic texts. Now, knowledge, knowledge is haram. Knowledge about Islam, outside of Islam and without Islam, is haram. So first of all, what exactly is this haram? I used it in the previous video and there was some confusion about this, so let me clarify this. Now, haram is ancient Arabic, okay? That's where it comes from. Haram today means anything which is forbidden or a sin, which is deemed unwanted in Islam or against Islamic law. For example, I mean, even in the old days, eating pork is called haram in 16.115. So the, in the transliteration, we have this inama harama. So here, harama is a verb, third person, male singular, past perfect, based on the root haramim. So Muslims will call a lot of things haram, which are not really and literally labeled as such in the Quran. So you need to watch out for this. Alcohol, or rather khamr, is such an example where the Quran nowhere declares it as being haram. Also, it shouldn't be confused with the word in al-Mashid al-Haram, mentioned some 16 times in the Quran and later defined as the holy mosque in Mecca. The usage here is interesting and shows the complete and utter lack of clarity in Islamic texts. Al-Mashid al-Haram actually means forbidden place or site of worship. So now it is up to the individual what they make of it and how they arrive at mosque, the holiest one in Islam at that. So you have haram, meaning forbid, prohibit, as verb. And then you have haram, the, the site, the, the sanctuary, holy site, or sometimes even wife, as adjective or noun. Now, harama has like prohibited the verb, which, which is a perfect third person male singular, and it's based on haramim the same way. It's just that the usage is different and therefore the meaning is different. So there's thousands of Islamic texts talking about this mosque, but very few tackle the etymological difficulty. Al-Mashid al-Haram literally means the site of worship which is inviolable, restricted, forbidden, sacred, and where fighting is forbidden. So even though a word can have opposite meanings, and is, this is not as rare as you might think in ancient Arabic, in this case, there is a differentiating factor in the grammar. It's truly amazing what languages are capable of. I mean, this demonstrates that ancient Arabic is anything but a precise language. It is totally dependent on study, context, and interpretation. So anyway, now, well, I hope that we all understand the different usage when used as a noun, as in sight, and as a verb in forbid, prohibit. Let me concentrate on the forbidden or prohibited meaning and how it relates to knowledge. Going through the Quran, the term knowledge is used more than a hundred times in different forms and in different contexts. Now I'm not going to list each and every occurrence, which, well, as a scholarly person will do, but I'm not. So I'm just going to select a few, analyze the intended meaning, as far as I can establish it, in a concise manner, because I actually wanted this to be well, just a quickie, but it looks like it's going to be a little bit longer. So. Exalted are you, we have no knowledge except what you've taught. This is the typical context of what the word knowledge is used as. The word knowledge here is male, accusative, a noun. Now look, let's look at the same word in the sunnah. In Bukhari alone, there are dozens of associations of the word knowledge with Islam, like it is religious knowledge. In book 317, bestow on him the knowledge of the book, teach him the knowledge of the book. And those who were the best in prison have also the best in Islam, they religious knowledge. None has the knowledge but Allah. No one knows its hidden meanings but Allah. And then finally, in the in the tafsir, 
al jalalain they they say glory be to you exalting you above any should object to you that any should object to you okay i don't know what that means we know not except what you have taught us okay this is clear again so surely um you, you are the knower wise from whose knowledge and wisdom nothing escapes so so god knows everything and we get everything from god and how do we get it from god well through the quran so the commentators such as the jalalains and ibn abbas and madudi they they completely agree which is why i will not show them for each of the sentences i'll be using as examples now it signifies the submission to a god an all-knowing god who provides some knowledge for us lowly humans and i've not found any indication which would make the usage of this word encourage us to look any further quite the opposite the jews and the christians are said to have suffered from further knowledge as is explained in 3:19 those who were given the book were not at variance except after the knowledge came to them being insolent one to another so a little further down in this chapter humans who have received some knowledge from their god should limit themselves to what they've been taught and not go any further so in 366 it says why do you argue about that of which you have no knowledge and allah knows while you do not so we see again and, and this is it happens all the time the link between knowledge and quran nothing more 752 we had brought to them a book distinct replete with knowledge and guidance and grace for men who believe so this shows quite clearly the intention to make the quran the book which provides all necessary knowledge for humans believers are then urged to learn about the contents of the quran but nothing else so looking through the sentences I did not see a single usage where the alleged words of a creator god tell people to look for anything outside his words in this book. 20114 be not in haste with the Quran before its revelation to thee is completed but say advance me in knowledge. The reference to knowledge here is in relation to the revelation of the Quran which is deemed knowledge. So what this god wants to provide in the form of knowledge has been provided and nothing over and above what is in the Quran is required and is indeed discouraged to pursue. Over and over we humans are advised that all knowledge resides with God. We are stupid and this god grants us some of the available knowledge sufficient for worshiping this god and fighting for this god but only some knowledge. So this god has taught humans all they need and all they need to know. and in an attempt at countering this apologists like you know like most muslims lack critical thinking skills and they comb the quran for words which can mean something like use one's intellect acquire knowledge learn study think ponder reflect and as far as i've been able to establish only managed to come up with words which refer to their creator god and nothing outside the quran like 3191 they reflect upon the creation of the heavens and the earth The word reflect is one of the most commonly used examples cited. They show rows and rows of the word in its different forms trying to impress the gullible with all the variations but never show the actual usage of these words. Now if I take a closer look at the usage it becomes painfully clear that the reader is instructed to reflect or consider or ponder the creation of the Islamic creator god nothing else. least of all nature okay well this was going to be a quick 6 minute video but then it looked as though i was hasty and not thorough enough and not really covering all the possibilities so that's why i will take some examples of the words and show exactly where and how the word is used so that i don't come across as being superficial so let's run down the apologies favor the word fakaru ponder or reflect and its usage in the quran so we let's start in chapter 2 It says uh, 219 says you you need to ponder God's sentences the Quran clearly referencing a god and not thinking about general knowledge 266 then repeats what 219 says in chapter 3 think of God's creation of heavens and earth 650 think about what is revealed by a god via an angel will then then not ponder the quran think about the signs of god think about what the messenger told you think about the signs by god think about the signs by god <laughs> think about the signs by god and what do you know 1644 think about the signs by god 
1669. I know it gets boring. Think about the signs by a god. 38. Think about what this god has created. Yet another repeat of the verse. Think about the signs. Defend your god and think the same again what the messenger told you. Another one. Think about the signs by a god. Think about the signs by a god. It's not me who wrote this, I swear. And then 47, 24, do they then not reflect on the Quran or are there locks on their hearts? And finally, 59, 28, be afraid of this God and think about it. Well, there you have it. They all refer to seeking knowledge and pondering the contents, but only of the Quran. And don't tell a believer they should go and learn about nature or anything outside of what this God says in the Quran. So... What other words can I think of which would convey anything educational? Well, the Quran implores the reader to simply accept and if they blindly believe, they are considered intelligent. Unlike all those untrusting, blind, dumb and deaf non-believers, they will know that he is one God and so that people of intelligence will pay heed. Telling the reader that if they consider themselves intelligent, they will blindly believe what is in the Quran and obey. Some apologists come up with various meanings of the word understand, which is used extensively in the Quran. But yet again, it is not intended for believers to stop and think, but rather to make it seem as though the act of blindly believing the contents of the Quran is in itself a worthy approach to gaining knowledge. For example, we see in 2935, we have left thereof a sign, a clear sign, onto a people who understand, insinuating that, well, we in heaven know what we're doing and you'll understand this unless you're dumb. So people nod, even though this does not make any sense at all. And this is, this is repeated over and over and culminates in the condescending statement, none shall question him about what he does. In other words, shut up and grovel. Don't ask, don't advance, don't learn and stick to the knowledge provided in the Quran. Learn about the Quran, but nothing more. Don't try and inject human explanations for the origin of species, including humans, but stay focused on divine manual creation. Well, that's it. Another word well, used frequently in the Quran is to reflect. And looking at the context, we see that, um, as is the case for knowledge, it is there to tell the followers to look at the Quran and God's creation and now bloody well appreciate it. And this is repeated again and again. And then, as Abu Dawood says, avoid novelties, for every novelty is an innovation, and every innovation is an error. So Sahih so Muslim echoes the saying that every innovation is an error, or he who did any act for which there is no sanction from our behalf that is to be rejected. And if someone innovates something which is not in harmony with the principles of our religion, that thing is rejected. So Hassan bin Ali reported, I have retained these words of the Messenger of Allah. Leave what causes you doubt and turn to what does not cause you doubt. These sentences explain why, why Muslims in general are so backwards and not only so, so much, you know, with illiterate, but also scientifically illiterate. Apologists notice this, of course, and try to make the situation look better than it is and instill a bit of remaining pride into their fellow brethren. And, in their despair, Muslim apologists have turned to weak and even fabricated hadiths, like the one saying, seeking knowledge is a duty upon every Muslim, which refers to Islamic Sharia. Someone told me that Muhammad issued the command, seek knowledge, even if you have to go to China. But this is made up. The same goes for a saying comparing ink of a scholar with, with blood of a martyr. Then after looking at different possibilities and options in Islamic texts, I have not found a single sentence in the Quran or anywhere which asks Muslims to look for knowledge over and above or outside the Quran or Islamic texts for that matter. All texts agree that knowledge refers to the understanding of the knowledge of the Quran, nothing else. I have, however, found hundreds of places where followers are encouraged to limit their endeavors to the Quran, that what was supplied by their God. And in summary, the Quran instructs its gullible followers to only think about what their creator God has provided. Live and die for this God, but don't ask questions. Simply obey. If you do this, 
ask not questions about things which, if made plain to you, may cause you trouble. You will be richly rewarded with food, drink, and women. But if not, you will be severely punished by eternal torture in the hellfire. And isn't that exactly what you would want if you're expanding your empire and all you need is men who fight for you? Men focused on fighting for their, well, worldly lord, staying away from wine and women as long as they are alive and can fight. The pleasures of alcohol and women come later when they're dead. Then they have time to enjoy. Here in this life, they fight. Here, they only need to know what the Quran gives them. The rest might just distract them. So, yes, for Muslims, real knowledge is haram as it can harm your faith and introduce confusion and doubt into your primary objectives. Thank you for your time.